Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when we feel like at o'clock again, and we got a trio of people with us today. I'm Pearl of Wisdom. This is Deli, Anthony Shadeli, awesome writer for the Anaheim Ducks, who we will be talking about today. And of course, you know Joe, Professor Joe Borick, finest in the land. And we have been doing a series already. We started, I already did an Arizona one, and uh, we are going to be doing a series, an off season series on the future look into each team in the NHL. So we came up Anaheim, and I'm like, I got to get the finest Anaheim writer in the land on the show. And sure enough, we got him. He decided to come. So, uh, and not only that, Delhi, uh, you um, just wrote something directly about what we're talking about right now. You, know, you just put something out a minute a minute ago. I saw it on the Twitter. I hadn't even had time to read it yet. So yeah. let's get into it, shall we? Um, I know you're pretty fired up about uh, what's going on in Anaheim there and some of the things that have been said by the manager and all that stuff like that. So you go at her, Delhi. Let's get started. What do, what do you have to say? Where do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. No, I'd love to start at the Shattenkirk signing and the Grant signing uh, and kind of lead into uh, what that kind of uh, revealed about Bob Murray's mindset uh, this offseason. So the Grant signing, I think uh, three years is too much. I wanted him. <laughs> I wanted him back because I think he even though he doesn't have great uh, advanced statistics that I think he, you want a guy who can produce in your fourth line like that. So I wouldn't have faulted them if they had given him a couple of years, but three seems like too many, excuse me. And then Shattenkirk, good signing. I mean, cheap. He's got some championship experience now. He's he's a good right-handed defenseman. The Ducks need that offensively productive puck-moving right-handed defenseman. Um, and those are great signings. In a, in a vacuum, that's awesome. Compare with their with their draft, they've they've had a good offseason. But when you look at the words that came out of Bob Murray's mouth and Kevin Shattenkirk's agent uh, during the interviews uh, following his signing. It was a little confusing. Like Shattenkirk's agent basically said that Murray convinced them that they were a contending team, that they were going to be competitive, and that was one of Shattenkirk's, I guess, uh, one of his requirements. And I and I looked at that and I was like, "What are what are they talking about? Like, <laughs> it, well, what? yeah, either they're lying. First they're of all, Shats like, maybe might want to think about firing his agent. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and second of all, it's like." all right, maybe they're being diplomatic. They're saying all the right things. That's great. Like that you can't fault anybody for being positive and, and trying to, to, to paint a, a positive picture. But then Murray kind of some quotes came out that we're looking to compete this year. And he says, he thinks, he thinks they compete for a playoff spot this year. And he mentioned it was paraphrasing his quote. He said, our young guys need to improve, which it's time for. And our old, our middle-aged guys need to need to step up a little bit. And I just thought like, that's actually a, a tall task. Like, that's your whole team. Who else do you have besides young guys and middle-aged guys? Like, <laughs> it, like you're, you're young Well, guys. you have Ryan Getzlaff, who would be characterized as old at this point, along with David yeah. Backus, who in hockey years would be characterized as old. So I guess he thinks the old guys are going to do well. So. Yeah, well, and, and if you look at it, I mean, that's my first – That's my, if you look at the holes the Ducks have, they don't have any scoring. They don't have any primary scoring. And they didn't have defensive scoring until they got Shattenkirk. Ho hopefully that works out. They don't have defensive zone ability, or they haven't the last three seasons. They've been in the bottom of the league in goals against. They've been in the bottom of the league in shots against for the last three seasons under two different coaches, multiple different def iterations of defensemen, and Manson, Lindholm, and Fowler have all been there. So it's not like this problem just – was an outlier. It's been happening for three years and it's hurt the performance of John Gibson. And so I think the Shattenkirk signing, while it was really good, isn't going to fix their problems to the point where the Ducks are suddenly a, a playoff contender. So that brings me to the middle-aged guys that he mentioned. So you've got Silverberg, you've got uh, Henrik that we were talking about. Henrik led the Ducks in goals, which is fine. But if you if you're expecting those guys to step up, like if you look at their body of work for the past four or five seasons, it's been roughly what they did last year. Like they've been performing at the level that you would expect them to. Expecting them to increase their abilities or increase their production at their age, I don't think is gonna. I, I mean, I think that's a tall order. So uh, you've really got multiple large holes you need to fill, and I just. That it makes me wonder what Bob Murray's going to do next. Like, is he also painting a, a, a rosy picture of what's actually going on, or is he planning to do something drastic? And I think, uh, Perlo, you mentioned 
if, if he's the, if he's looking at offloading a defenseman or someone like that, it's like, well, what are your needs? You need a scorer, so line A's available. They're looking for an established NHL player. So are you going to trade Manson or Lindholm to the Jets to get line A along with probably a small, a, a younger prospect and a couple picks? Like those are exactly the building blocks you need for your team to be good in the next couple of years, which I think they can be, but like, don't trade them away. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're basically taking it, creating a bigger hole in one part of your team to plug up a hole in another part of your team while also kind of robbing your future, your future bank account, I guess you'll call it not, not literally bank account, but your talent pool. So I don't know. I, I, either he's lying or he's about to make a really bad decision. Yeah. Um, Joe, you, I, I wanted to bring this up because you mentioned Grant and uh, Joe knows all about Grant. So <laughs> <laughs> Joe's yeah. a Philadelphia Flyers fan. So, yeah. Uh, and you know all about Grant because he was there before and now he's coming back again, which is kind of odd in itself. Three times. This Three is times time. now. <laughs> but uh, third I mean, times the charm. A yeah. fourth line center. Okay. I get your point. Like, okay. <laughs> bring him back. I do love his heart and soul type thing and stuff like that. But Joe, um, what, from an outside perspective, this has been fa- uh, come more of an inside uh, thing with uh, Delhi here where he covers them all the time. From an outside perspective, how do you view Anaheim and where they should be going, say, in the next two years? Where we, where would you view that? Um, well, yeah, it's semi-outside because for OT, they're one of the teams I pay attention to. But like I was telling Delhi before the podcast, in a condensed season – if you're going to be competitive, whether that was just a lure to Kevin Shank, which I 100% think that's all that was, um, but be that as it may, you definitely need in this type of season when it seems like we're going to try to play all 82 in a condensed format, a very solid backup goal. Like you can't just have, like, unless if you think Anthony Stellar's which Anthony Stellars is my dude. I liked him coming up, watching him with the Phantoms and stuff, playing in the Flyers system. But I think he's more of a backup than like a 1B, which in this condensed type of season, you 100% need a 1B because you can't just exhaust your starting goaltender because then if you make the playoffs anyway, your starting goaltender is going to be dead. So that's not going to be too helpful to begin with. Um, So... I think uh, that's something you need to start with. And I think what we, what you were uh, saying as well, uh, Shattenkirk's a very nice addition, but the Ducks, in my opinion, needed one of those defensemen that's more of a lockdown, steady defenseman in their own zone, playing on the, like in the defensive end, rather than all these guys that are great at moving the puck, good in the offensive end, put up good offensive numbers, but struggle – uh, on the in their own zone, defending uh, their ice and even bl- to get in position to block shots at times. Not all these guys are very consistent, other than Fowler in that category. Uh, that's something that I'm surprised they didn't go as much after. Um, even like an old, like if you're gonna if you're saying you're competitive for next year, the reason why I feel like that type of stuff might not be true is a guy that's solid in his own defensive end that you could probably get for what, like maybe two million, two five in the final year of his career, maybe, if you think you're gonna be good next year, would be Chara. So like you make those moves if you're like, oh, we're gonna be very good next year. Well, you're not gonna make those moves if you just are saying that to bring somebody in, but you don't think that. So that's also why I'm not sure that's the case. A guy though that I think the Jets could use is a guy that is pretty good on the defensive end is Travis Hamanick because he's not just good on the offensive end. He can move the puck with some pretty good uh, – he's pretty good on the offensive end as well, but he ain't no slouch defensively. He's actually pretty good defensively, grades pretty well as an all-around defenseman. That's why I'm surprised he didn't get signed yet, but uh, that is what it is. So he's still there for people to grab him, and I do think he wouldn't be a bad pickup, but I do think – Murray hit it on the head. You need Sam Steele. You need Jones. You do need the young guys to step up more. But Delhi also hit it on the head. How he explained it is basically he should have just said, we need our entire team other than old people to step up on our team. 
because he basically said everybody other than their old guys, which would only be on the Ducks, David Backus and Ryan Getzla. So you need everyone other than two people, basically, to step up is what he, by accident, I think, said, because I'm sure he meant he, you just need everyone to step up as a whole in, in hindsight. Um, but that that's entirely true. It's just you need to add something into that core, like you were saying, too. Uh, Shattenkirk's a good defensive ad, but you need more of a guy like a Hamannick or another defensive defenseman type, and you need that steady goal scorer. But the only way you're getting that is by being able to trade somebody to free up more cap space because – there's a steady goal scorer on the market, but do you feel like you got to be pretty damn sure you're going to be winning soon if you go out and pay Mike Hoffman? So mm-hmm. you're not going to do that if you don't think you're winning soon. So yeah, I I would have to. I'm, I'll go quickly here, kind of taking both of what you said and say my, what I see in this. I think you did really well to illustrate the probable actuality of what he's saying here. <laughs> this is what I see from it. Shattenkirk was took a pretty big loss after New York getting bought out. He's trying to dig himself back into some more money again. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, goes to Tampa Bay because he wasn't going to get any money anywhere else anyway, so he might as well go where the cup may be. Happens to win the cup. Now, without saying it, he's like, I took the money, man. <laughs> and yeah. I'm was giving me the money. Uh, <laughs> the money's out there. I'm so I'm not going to go there saying that though. I'm going to go there saying my agent convinced me that Anaheim's going to be good enough next year. And you would have to get, I guess, if this is going to be the case, Murray is correct. Raquel's going to have to play a lot better than he did did for sure. That's the big one right there, right? Yeah, yeah. We got to see Raquel step up a lot. But you're looking up the middle. Getzloff's not getting any better, like you said. It, uh, exact opposite. So now we're putting our hopes on Steele, this young kid that probably was never projected as a number one as uh, at all anyways. Milano, Heinen. Yeah. These are very questionable. Uh, it's just very questionable to come and say all of this with this lineup, right? Yeah, they have a whole, I mean, they have a whole slew of centermen on their roster and in their, that are going to be in their camp, but they don't have for sure a number one. And I think you could even argue a number two at this point. You know, Getzlav at this point in his career is, is probably a decent number two, probably better off number three center. Same with Henrique. So I just it's just it's too many holes for them to be competitive. And Joe, going back to what you're talking about with the backup goalie situation, I am a huge proponent of playing Gibson less and playing a backup more. But if you're going to be competitive, like you're going to need either Ryan Miller to come back and, back and play more than he did because he hasn't played. I mean, he's played relatively good amount of games, even in spite of an injury two years ago. But he, I mean, you need, you need, to, I'm thinking you need to maybe give him like, give Gibson in the range of 45 to 55 starts and, and start the backup the rest. Like, so it's, it's a very, it's just, a, it's, a, there's so many holes in the roster. It's hard for well, me to believe that Murray was being honest. Let's and- try to solve a couple problems here though, that Steve and I were talking about earlier, uh, Pirlo and I were talking about um, before uh, you joined the call. Uh, would you trade for one of Carolina's goalies to be the backup to piggyback with Gibson? I wouldn't either rhyme yeah, or if I'm Bob Murray, if I, yeah, if I'm in Bob Murray's position, I'm doing a completely opposite approach. I'm going I'm going with what the Kings are doing. I'm sticking with my draft picks. I'm sticking with my prospects. I'm waiting another year while the cap while I'm closer to the cap. Hey, we got Shattenkirk. We didn't give up any any assets for Shattenkirk and Grant. Just keep everything. See how it goes this year. Don't invest in a if you're not going to get Ryan Miller back, don't invest in a more expensive backup goalie. Just keep things as is. If you have a decent season, maybe your everybody steps up, your whole team steps up. You could you could battle for the playoffs. I don't think that's going to happen. And if you don't make the playoffs, you get you get in the lottery, you maybe get another good pick. So I just I, I hold off for another year. And I use the example of the Kings because that is seems to be exactly what the Kings are doing. They didn't really make any major moves in free agency. They've had two great drafts in a row. They've got some young up and coming players. 
it's going to be real interesting kind of compare and contrast if Bob Murray does go out and continue to, to buy and trade and decides to trade assets to That's see who, yeah, to see whose approach is going to, is going to be better because I, I, I really think the Kings so far have done it the right way. I think that's exactly what he is doing. He's just using certain language to, uh, for ticket sales. I mean, you've got to remember, Anaheim's not like going to for sure fill the building, although they do well. But yeah. he's got to have a certain can, language to say we're going to be competitive and all of those sort of things like that. But Shattenkirk screams to me as buying an expansion fodder. This is the guy. We don't want to lose anybody off our roster and expansion. So give Shattenkirk, four million dollars a year. By the way, he's friends with a few players on the Anaheim roster, so he gets to hang out with his friends for a year. <laughs> and um, when it comes too. time for the expansion team to pick a player, he looks pretty good at four million dollars a year. Yeah. Right. So um, it, it's just like we don't want you to pick anybody else that's already on here. And I think that's exactly what Murray is doing. Seeing what this turns out to. be be as this year and then from there they'll just keep on allowing the draft picks to keep on growing into they're doing a uh uh it's a it's um not a tear down but they're they're building a team simple yeah, as that exactly. and they're trying to build a team without telling the using the words rebuild or whatever the case may be retool. that's the new word yeah. retooling your team yeah, yeah. I mean, and that, if he if he is doing that, that's fine. But if he if he goes out and and kind of sticks to his word, I mean, if if you read the the articles I'm referencing are the uh, the most recent articles in the L.A. Times and the Athletic by Eric Stevens and Jack Harris, where they're talking to Shattenkirk's agent. Murray had me convinced that he thinks that they're that they're buyers now that they're going to go out and start <laughs> start having well, up talent. And if he if he's if he's a convincing liar, then that's fine. That's cool. But you also look at it like I don't see what the what the harm is in doing what the Rangers did a couple years ago, where it's like, hey, listen, we're not doing well. We haven't been doing well for a while. Just give us <laughs> just give us some time. We'll be better soon. Like exactly. That's, it. I like that. I like that transparency. I think it's better overall. And and the owners, the Samuelis, are are. I mean, I haven't met them in person, but from all indications. They're patient, smart people. I, I like to say they kind of, in my experience, compared to the the other team in town, the Kings. There, it's kind of like Walmart versus your mom and pop shop. Like, the Ducks are your mom and pop homegrown. Like, they treat their employees well. They're the local. They're the local. Uh, the local business. And then there's the Kings, the big corporate on Schutz Media, and and uh, there there isn't really a lot of. Uh, it's, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to disparage the Kings because actually they're doing a good job. But it's just. It's just. A, it's like big corporate versus small, like local. Sure. That's what it kind of feels like. The Ducks I have a hometown, a very, a very hometown feel. But uh, so I, I think that the Samuelis would be okay with something like that, like being honest with the fans, saying, "Hey, listen, we're we're going to be out of it for another season, but look out next year because we've got some cap space. We've got some young players who should be in the prime of their career, and we've got some prospects who are going to be getting into the NHL." I, I mean, I think there's no problem with that. I agree with that approach, and you had uh, the Ducks also had a very solid draft this year, but I think if you don't get Miller back. Uh, Craig Anderson, if he doesn't retire, or Jimmy Howard, because they're just cheap veterans that you're not going to be paying any more than Ryan Miller made, um, I think are guys that you could potentially look to, because then both of those guys have a chance to have a good, solid backup season. And then if they don't, you just go to Anthony Stolarz anyway. That rather than going to Stolarz, who I think has a chance to be a good backup, but not necessarily a 1B that has to play a lot in a condensed season, Howard has played a lot of games in the past, as recently as two years ago and actually put up a, like 905 save percentage. He just sucked last year. So hopefully he can bounce back from that, which I think he will. Pirlo doesn't think so as much when we talked about this earlier. But uh, Craig Anderson also could be an option because the only other guys is really Michael Hutchinson's of the world, the Michael Condon's, and uh, Andrew Hammond, uh, the Hamburglar. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, so uh, you have those options as well. That's why I would say it'll probably be Ryan Miller or Craig Anderson. But I do really like the Ducks uh, draft this year, though, I must say, because getting Drysdale, obviously, uh, also is a guy that some compared to Niedermeyer 
uh, name that many Ducks fans know. Uh, Perot's a great, one of the best shots in the draft. Sam Colangelo, in my opinion, is one of the better second round picks. He had some injuries, but I always thought whoever locked him up and got him would have a good second round pick. And then Ian Moore and Nickel uh, in the third and fourth round are two bigger defensemen with some potential. So those were two good ladder round pickups, in my opinion. And then you uh, had three uh, forwards to close it out. Uh, so I thought overall it was a pretty good uh, draft again to keep uh, ironing out the stock pool in the minors. Uh, what did you think about that, Deli? I was wondering. Yeah, I loved that draft. I thought it was uh, uh, strangely, um, I think Ducks fans also were surprised that Bob Murray didn't try to like rethink the wheel and just went directly with what they needed. They got a put- right-handed put- All three defensemen they drafted were right-handed shots. They got a right-handed puck mover in Drysdale. They got the second, probably the second best or best shooter and scorer potentially, uh, or I won't say shooter or scorer, second best shot or best shot behind Alexander Holtz in the draft. And hopefully he can put it all together and, and be that sniper that the Ducks also really need. Those are two huge needs right there. That was both in the first round. And then you get uh, Colangelo. I think I, I saw him compared to Alex Tuck if he if he pans out, which Good is can't that. Yeah, and then uh, Ian Moore. I I think that, I think they could have switched the more. I mean, they got him both, so it's really semantics. But I think they probably should have been switched in terms of a third and fourth pick. I like Nickel uh, a little better in terms of his development and his size and and his skating ability. He seems like he's further along than Moore was, and Moore uh, straight out of high school in the in the New England prep school kind of league. It's it's a great league. It's very competitive. It usually you go from there to a junior league or a college before you end up hearing your name called in the draft. So uh, I think third round might have been a little too early for him, but he could pan out. He's the he's the type of pick. I think that more competitive teams like to make where it's like you're contending. You've got a lot. Of your your cap is you're up and three or four years to take over for someone who's suddenly going to get more expensive. So I think more was more that type of pick but i i if they got a guy like nickel in a later round so i i don't fault them for that uh the Golomov pick is going to be interesting this russian small russian guy who can score if he ever comes to the united states i'd like to see what he can do um and then sunsvik i know almost yeah. nothing about but it's uh it's it's worried. always good to take those ladder round guys with skill though like even like even if you don't know he's going to come to the states that's probably one of the only reasons he fell because he has a ton of skills so it's good to take those chance guys, because then you look like a genius if mm-hmm. they do come over and provide for you as you drafted yeah, the dude in the, fi- in the fifth round. Yeah, in the fifth round, uh, you drafted. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, though. I do think Nico has a chance to be a little bit better than Moore, because you had 39 points as a rookie in the QMJHL um, in 58 games. That's pretty darn good. So uh, that's a great pickup in the fourth round. Uh, they had a very good draft in my eyes as well, especially when um, uh, you get a guy, like you said, in the fifth round that has a chance to really pan out and gal him off as long as he comes over from Russia. And then you close it out with two centers. Um, so in Bowen and then uh, Sundvik, I think is how you say that guy's name. Yeah. Yeah. And Bowen, Bowen, um, I'm actually interested. I, I don't know a lot about his game. I haven't watched, but I've the little bit I've read, he broke his hand in his 17 year old season. So, I mean, for a hockey player, especially a centerman, that's a pretty tough injury to recover from right away. So you wonder if that kind of dipped his draft, draft stock a little bit. And then he's also going to the University of North Dakota. I mean, if, if he ends up staying committed there and COVID doesn't mess things up like it has for some other players. So, I kind of compare him a little bit to a guy maybe like Troy Terry where he's drafted in the later round and his, his potential for his stock to rise once he gets into college I think is there because he's he'll get over his injury by that point and playing in a, in a program like North Dakota kind of like Troy Terry did with Denver and such a competitive collegiate uh, like collegiate league I think he could blossom I, I like I said I don't I'm not predicting he's going to be like <laughs> some steal in the seventh round but there are the ingredients there that might make him kind of more valuable come two or three years from now than he is now. So as you're talking make, it, about this, I'm starting to kind of get maybe what Murray is saying here, because in his, in the earlier drafts, uh, like the last few drafts of Anaheim, they've kind of gone with your defensive third liners uh, up the middle and stuff like that. 
So now all of a sudden he starts going for some skilled players pretty all the way through, right? So you start to see the layers he's building with. So when he says um, we're going to start going for it soon, maybe he's not lying. If, if you've got Lunderstrom and all those guys like that, being able to fill up your third line so you don't have to do what we were just talking about with the Oilers, with Cassian for $3.5 million or something like that, right? So you're building your third line with ELC-type uh, players. You're young players, but they're still really good defensively. And, and then now you're starting to – now they're starting to look at a higher skill set as far as drafting is concerned. With that in mind, they may think as an organization that their third-line players that are – that they've been drafting this last little while are coming up now. So mm-hmm. now we can start looking and pay, spending money on more skill because we're not going to be paying our third-line players $3.5, $4 million a year like a lot of organizations are. So I'm going to say devils, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and say this is kind of a plan all the way along because they do have some very good prospects. It's just they're not high-end shooter prospects. But you may be able to go and start looking at guys like – you meant got people you mentioned like Lion Air or something like that. Um, Dodonov would have been great if he didn't go to Ottawa or Hoffman or something like that. And start putting your money towards that and banking on your younger players that you've been drafting to come up and fill those third line roles. Does that sound something like yeah, maybe he might be thinking? Well, are you saying that he might be willing to trade like a Zegris or a, I mean, in the terms of Lion a Zegris or, or a Perot or the guys that are maybe going to take a couple more years? in the skill positions and replace them with current NHL skill, like kind of speed up the process. Possibly can- like considering the fact that they drafted so well for their defensive type players, mm-hmm. they could maybe start reaching out for a little few more forwards just to get this uh, rebuild. Let's call it what it is. Rebuild moving in a faster position. Yeah. Uh, whatever. That might be what he's thinking. Just playing devil's yeah. advocate here. No, no, I, 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 that makes sense to me. I just don't know. I don't know if the timing is still is is right for that because if you if you end up getting like letting a guy like Zegris or or um, Perot get to the NHL and see kind of what they're. I mean, they might be better than Line ends up being or, because Line has been great, but like you, you never know. And the windows are still open for a lot of other teams in the NHL that you're suddenly going to have to compete against, like the Lightning, like the Golden Knights. The Golden Knights are in your division. You're going to be having, having to get through them in the, probably the second round for the next two or three years, three or four years at least. Yeah. Why not give them a couple years for their for their to come up against their cap a little bit and, and build, I think, a little more organic or I always say organically. It's like my least favorite word. Homegrown. Uh, and and give it and, and and give yourself a little bit more of a window. Delay that window by a year, maybe. I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of an NBA mindset in terms of the way that that league works. Whether you've got the Lakers and the Warriors who are pretty much going to dominate the trust Warriors the years process. ago. Yeah, trust the pro. And then like you wait until you kind of stockpile and stockpile until those teams have kind of crapped the bed, and then it's your turn. Like, and you can trade and all that stuff. Maybe they are doing that, but I think in the NHL, it's it's a little bit wiser to to hold on to your homegrown talent, especially with the way their the salary cap is, and and then go because I think they could do that. And if they if they get if they move up and kind of speed up their rebuild by trading their unproven prospects that are supposed to be their skilled players for currently established NHL skilled players, then you're probably cutting two or three years off of that window you have at the end when those guys get older and need another contract. It's just, I think it's better to wait at least another, uh, wait one more season, wait till the 2021 season, see who goes in the expansion draft and then spend out the wazoo in free agency, make some trades, Trader Bob Murray, like just that's the year. I think you should be aiming for 2021 where you're surprising a lot of people. Right. Um, Joel, let's just begin a second. The, I, the, you brought up a good point. Um, expansion's going to leave a lot of players out there right now mm-hmm. because there's going to end for cheap because people are going to want to get get something for a lot of players that could go in expansion. So that's something that could be in Murray's head too. Joel, I'll let you go one more time here. We're going to wrap her up in the next little bit. But is there anything else you'd like to add to this, Joe? 
No, I was just going to say that's exactly why I think uh, I agree with Doe. I think you're better off. You have a lot of solid young players, especially if Zegers comes up. Steele's a good young guy developing. Jones is developing. Terry's still developing. Milano, you brought over there along with Hyneem, who didn't work in their last uh, teams as well. But they fit into the equation better here, so I'd like to see what they can do. Excuse me. Um, So the only guy you should really get I guess if you want to score as just someone older, like a veteran, you can get for like a million bucks or something in the free agency that's just been known to score at times. Like, for example, slow as hell, Ilya Kovalchuk, if you want him for one year. Uh, just bring him in as a veteran minimum. Like, he'd probably get like 900K, a million at most. So, uh, but other than that, uh, you shouldn't be, uh, you should wait a year because you should see what happens with the expansion and just let these guys develop um and continue to have guys come up as they show that they're ready to come up uh in the off season or d- during the season hopefully if you have an AHL season uh, I do think it would be good though to try to add one more defenseman because if you're looking now you have Fowler this is not what, what I'm saying the defensive line should be but your top six would be Fowler, Lindholm, Manson, Shattenkirk, Larson, and then when you get there, you're between Karan, Hughes, and like a couple other people. So I would like, I don't, I mean, to me, that would be a position that I would say you might strike a light bulb and go, I would add one other guy there at least. Yeah, I like that idea. I like, I, I like Christian Jews. I think he's going to be actually pretty good for the Ducks, but I, I just want, I just want them to get a guy, a solid stay at home defenseman. You're not going to be able to get a guy, an expensive one, but just someone who's maybe a tall guy, a lot of reach, physical. I mean, good Branson actually had a decent season in that respect last year before they traded him, but uh, they need even someone better than that, I think, to really solve their problems. All right, I agree. And um, oh, there's something else I was going to say. Oh, I think maybe also, and we'll finish her up on this, yeah. I think also Murray might be using this kind of language for – to uh, for the benefit of Gibson's brain, um, I really think this guy is like Gibson is maybe the best goaltender in the NHL. You can make an argument for sure, top five, no doubt about it, no argument about that. And he is extremely competitive. And I just don't think you want to be putting in the words in the head of a guy like Gibson about using terms like rebuild and all of this stuff like that. He's at the prime of his career. He doesn't deserve it. If you're not going to be it in the next two or three years, let him go. And I've been saying this a long time. And that's, I think, in his mind. And they don't want to do that. So from what I'm hearing is they're looking at a window of two, three years. They want to be competitive for a cup. When you And, and if you've got Gibson there, that's the way you only way you can really look at it. Would you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I think that's a that's a reasonable timeline. I think they can absolutely be competitive for a cup in two to three years. Right. So that's where we go. See, we solved all the Anaheim Ducks problems right here <laughs> time to time for the Wizard Ministries. This is the reason why we get great writers like Deli and Joe Bark, uh, the professor. So you can come and hear this. If you have any disagreement with this, please tell us in the comment section all everything. Or if you agree with it completely, uh, anything. We, we have, uh, I, I don't know about them, but uh, my ego is very low. So hearing compliments <laughs> helps out an awful lot. So compliments works too. <laughs> and hit the like. Don't like if you want. If you want to hurt my feelings, hit the don't like if you want to do that. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you do, do it. And then subscribe. And uh, thank you for coming, Delhi. Uh, could you also you. send your uh, – uh, I'm gonna. I'll put your article down in the comment section. Now, any other articles that we referenced today, put them down in the comment section so our fine fans here can, can listen to or read some of the stuff we were talking about and who, how they were talking about. All you Anaheim guys out there – Tell us what you think, and thank you for coming to listen to this fine programming. Have a great day, everybody. Lots of love to ya. Thanks.